So sea lamprey were one of the first and most destructive invasive species to enter the Great Lakes. Um, at the peak of their invasion from the 1940s to the 1960s, they were killing about 100 million pounds of fish per year. Now, thanks to intensive control efforts, uh, today that number is around 10 million, um, but there is still uh, a lot of interest in finding new ways to monitor and control this very destructive invasive species. One of the ways sea lampreys are controlled is the larval stage of the sea lamprey lives in Great Lakes tributaries. And uh, members of sea lamprey control will electrofish these tributaries and identify tributaries that have high numbers of sea lamprey and treat them with a lamprey specific toxin. Uh, specifically targeting streams that are high in abundance so there can be a cost savings measure in this treatment. So we were interested if we could use environmental DNA as a supplement to current electrofishing protocols in finding a larval sea lamprey across the Great Lakes. Um, not as a replacement for electrofishing, but as a way of uh, further expending, uh, extending um, our ability to monitor this invasive species. So the basic sampling design for the study was to pick 54 sampling stations on 12 rivers across the Great Lakes. And at each of these stations, we were doing paired electrofishing and environmental DNA monitoring. So on each of the 12 rivers, we sampled at three to five stations per river. And at each station, there was a variety of sampling that occurred. So we did eDNA sampling, where we collected three biological replicates at each visit, and we did a visit in the summer, fall, and winter, so there is a nice temporal component to our data set as well. Additionally, these summer and fall um, eDNA sampling events were also paired with an electrofishing survey, so we do have quite a uh, expansive data set with also a nice temporal component to it. So a lot of this conference has been discussing um, eDNA workflows, um, eDNA methodology. Uh, so I won't talk about it too much. Uh, one of the things that, in the results I'll talk about in a moment, that was one of our keys to success, is really putting a lot of thought and effort into how we were training field crews, because we were working with field crews from the DFO and US Fish and Wildlife, who were very professional in what they do, except a lot of them did have eDNA training. And we wanted them to be able to execute um, an eDNA protocol reliably and effectively each time they went out. So a lot of effort was put into not only creating extensive training programs for them, but also formatting the protocols in a way that they are easily followed by a large number of people. Because we did have over 25 people working in three different field crews in two countries helping to collect samples for this project. So getting them to all follow the exact same protocol and do it effectively was a big part of what we did. Also, um, everyone's favorite topic in eDNA, which is contamination. Um, it was a concern, and we uh, implemented a pretty rigorous uh, implementation of negative controls in order to sort of survey what rates of contamination we're going to experience. So we included negative controls at each of the major pathways in our uh, analysis because we were doing um, targeted detection of the sea lamprey using a probe-based qPCR assay. So for the field negatives, uh, we collected 162 in total, and a single negative control was collected for each sampling event at each one of those stations. As well, for the extraction negative controls, um, we kept pretty rigorous um, documentation of the ratio of negative controls collected and also the total number, and this helped us when we did get contamination back, because we did get a little bit. Um, we were able to isolate what exact samples are linked to that negative control, and it made the data interpretation much easier. Um, we did get a little bit of contamination, but fortunately it was in very low rates, as I'll talk about in a bit, and we only got it at the field, sta at the field stage of sampling, so no contamination was found at the lab or QPCR analysis. Um, interestingly as well, over 70% of our field negative, uh, or our field contamination, occurred on a single day, so it was concentrated in just five negative control, so someone clearly had a very bad day that day. Um, so yeah, I'll just jump right into the results. So in total, um, first what we did is because we were able to link those contamination events to field sampling events, we just excluded any detections we got from the um, field samples that were associated with those contaminated negative controls, and then we accumulated the detections from both electrofishing and environmental DNA sampling. And what we found was pretty cool. At 79% or 53 of those, or sorry, 43 of those 54 stations, sea lamprey or environmental DNA detections match electrofishing detections. So if it was negative, both were negative, um, and at positive sites, 
uh, was found as well. What was interesting, though, is that at 10 stations, or 19% um, of our total sampling stations, there was no detection of uh, ceiling break DNA molecule. And I want to be very specific about getting on the whole conversation about inferring species presence. Um, but so yeah, there were 10 different stations where we found um, presence of ceiling break DNA, where electrofission did not pick up ceiling break presence um, in either of the surveys. What was also interesting is taking our data from the negative controls, we were able to use a likelihood estimation model in order to estimate the probability of false positives, both in the sort of availability of the DNA and of a false positive DNA in a biological replicate, and also its occurrence in a qPCR replicate. And as you can see, both these numbers are quite low, and that uh, was really useful because we were able to take uh, with this and also being able to easily exclude con uh, events that we need to be contaminated. Uh, it gave us higher confidence in the detections we were getting, but they weren't based on uh, contamination. So one of the interesting use cases of eDNA monitoring for the ceiling ray that emerged is that the majority of our novel detections, so where we found presence of the ceiling ray DNA um, at stations where they did not find electro find ceiling ray presence through electrofission was in the assessment of um, sea lamprey moving back in and larvae recruiting in rivers that had recently been treated with this toxin. So both the Cedar and East Twin Rivers had been treated in 2020 with uh, sea lamprey toxin. Um, and no, uh, electrofishing did not find sea lamprey presence along any of these rivers, but we got multiple hits, um, or at multiple stations, we got detections of, from our environmental DNA sampling. And because it's of interest how quickly sea lamprey move back into rivers and already start getting recruited after TFM treatment, this might emerge as an interesting use case for environmental DNA where we can rapidly screen recently treated rivers uh, for larval recruitment at a rate that's more sensitive potentially than electrofishing. Okay. Uh, and to my supervisor, this is Bob Hanner and Margaret Docker, and also thank you for, to the GLRC for funding this project and all our partners at the DFO, University of Guelph, University of Manitoba, and the Fish and Wildlife. <laughs>